Well, folks, I have a real treat for you today. At least it is a real treat if you love data like I do. And it's a real treat for you if you've been asking the question that many people have been asking, which is, what about the latency of the Runcam Eagle? You've heard that the latency of the Runcam Eagle is higher than that of a usual board camera. You've heard maybe the 45 millisecond or 40 millisecond spec thrown around for the Eagle versus a something like a maybe a 20 millisecond spec for the uh, the traditional PZ0242 whatever or the 1177. And I remember that uh, that Final Glide said he felt like the latency on the Eagle was too much. He felt like you could feel it. And I believe him when he says that. But I'm not Final Glide. And I thought, what could I do to test this hypothesis myself? Now, here's the problem with that. It is very, very hard to accurately measure the true latency of a video system. And I have a video about why that is and you can go watch that video after you're done watching this one if you want all the details the gist of it is though that the the stopwatches many people use like you put a stopwatch app up on your phone they don't actually update fast enough to measure the kind of latency differences we're talking about they're counting at a very you know at the say millisecond level but they're not updating the display at the millisecond level level and even if they wanted to do that, the screens that we're using, they don't update fast enough. And if you think about an NTSC feed, that's the real bottleneck. Everything you could do is bottlenecked by the fact that you're using either an NTSC or maybe a PAL feed. NTSC feed has a frame rate of 30 frames per second, which means that you will never get more resolution than 1 over 30 hertz. So what can we do? What can we do? Well, there's a, a, a blog post I saw once where somebody took a photo diode and they aimed the photodiode at a pixel on the screen. And they used an oscilloscope to measure the voltage rise on the photodiode compared to the voltage rise of the pulse that they were using to light up the pixel. Wow, I'm not set up to do that. That is accurate, but I can't do that. So then I thought to myself, what is it that we're really trying to measure? Well, what we're really trying to measure is human reaction time. The, the latency of the camera is incidental what we really care about is how fast can I respond to something happening in my goggles? And then I thought, well, gosh, I can do that. Look right here. We could, we, there's this thing. See how this works? Now, some of you are thinking right now, that's not accurate. There's all these other things like your browser and your mouse and the, okay, I'm not trying to measure the absolute how fast my reaction time is in real life. All I'm trying to do is get a consistent metric to see if one camera is slower than the other. And so even if this is not necessarily perfectly accurate, all that really matters is that it is internally consistent and then we can compare the results. And that's what I've done. I did 300 trials. I sat here and I clicked this freaking thing 300 times and then I recorded the data and that's what we've got. And now let's look at the results. The first thing I'm gonna show you here is the average response time for the naked eye, the eagle, and the 1177. And what I did here was I put my goggles on and I held my copter in my hand and I aimed the camera at the screen and then I just ran the test a hundred times. I did that with no goggles on. I did that holding the eagle in my hand and holding an 1177 in my hand. Got that? So here we're measuring my actual reaction time to a visual impulse with these with the exact setup that I use when I'm actually flying. Isn't that cool? Now my reaction time, it won't surprise you to learn that my reaction time with the uh, with the naked eye was significantly faster than that of either of the cameras. And it's also interesting to talk about that the two cameras are very close together, 349 versus 344 on average. Notice also that the standard deviation for the two is relatively similar. Although on, I actually did this one yesterday and I did these two this morning. So you'll notice that the standard deviation for the, for the naked eye is higher than that of the two cameras. And that probably just means that yesterday I, I had a little bit less coffee in my system maybe, and I was a little less consistent than today. But I did these two side by side, the Eagle and the 1177, so that they would be as consistent as possible. And I'm no expert on statistics, but I think that the fact that the standard deviation is reasonably close between these two suggests that my performance was reasonably consistent between them. In other words, if there's a difference here, then I'm not the limiting factor. Now, I've also done a 95% uh, confidence interval calculation. And for those of you who aren't statistics nerds, basically a confidence interval tells you how likely the results 
that you're getting R to be reflective of the underlying system. Let me give you an example. Let's say we're going to have a, a game. I'm going to bet you $100 that I am better at throwing darts than you are. So we each take a dart. I throw the dart. I hit the bullseye. And you throw the dart. And you don't hit the bullseye. And then we go, see, I'm better than you. Well, maybe I'm not better than you. Maybe I just got lucky. So you say, hang on. <laughs> let's throw Let's throw 10 darts. Let's throw 50 darts. Let's throw 100 darts. And you can see intuitively that the more darts we throw, the more valid the conclusion is that I'm better than you. If I, if I keep scoring higher and you keep scoring lower and we throw 10 darts, you could say, ah, I was just tired today or I just got unlucky. But if we throw a thousand darts and after all of that, I'm still beating you and probably better than you. The more samples we have, the more confident we can be that our results are reflective of the, the reality of the underlying data. And a, a statistical confidence interval gives, a, or they also call it a p-value, it gives us a, a mathematical way of quantifying the confidence we can have in the results. What, it, what I've done here is I've calculated the 95% confidence interval, and that is telling us that the actual average, so we've got an average of 349.79, there's a 95% probability that the actual average of the underlying phenomena that we're measuring is at 349 plus or minus 6.73 milliseconds. So that's our sort of a range of valid values with 95% confidence. And you can see that we, we, the, the eagle was slightly slower by about five milliseconds than the 1177 in my testing. But when we take the confidence intervals into account, 349 plus or minus six milliseconds, 344 plus or minus seven milliseconds, we can actually see that with 95% confidence, we can't, with these results are not distinguishable from each other. And here, just for fun, I've calculated an 80% confidence interval, which statistically speaking, and again, I'm not a statistics nerd, but 80% confidence is, is very, very, it's, it's nothing. It's, you're not confident at all. This is a very low standard, okay? And even at an 80% confidence, we can see 349 plus or minus 4, 344 plus or minus 5. We can see even at that low level of standard, we still haven't definitively determined that the eagle is faster than the 11 or slower than the 1177. Now, I know there's actually a separate statistical test for A is greater than B, and I'm not sure that I'm actually applying this 100% right. But I'm pretty sure my rough conclusion is correct that at least for me, with my human reaction time and everything else in the system, there's not a significant difference between the Eagle and the 1177. That is, that might, that, that doesn't mean that there is not more latency in the Eagle than the 1177. It just means that when taken as a whole, I don't experience any net reduction in performance as a result of that. I've got one more thing to show you. Actually, two more things to show you. One of them is I've got an example of me flying that is going to show you how much of a difference there really isn't between them. And uh, you'll see that in a minute. And I also want to show you this histogram that I made. Oh, I know that's what you're really here to see is histograms, right? Here's a histogram of my response time results. Uh, and so here we've got the milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, 225, 250. These are bins. So everything from 200 to 225 is in here, 225 to 250, and so on. And you can see here the naked eye is clearly faster. And the eagle and the 1177, there's some small differences, but overall they're very, very similar. And now I'd like to show you some flight video. This was flown through the Runcam Eagle. This is the high def footage, not the eagle footage. But the, I was flying through the eagle. This was just a couple days ago. And you tell me if you think my reaction time is being hampered by the camera. The reason I picked this example is that I respond to three separate visual stimulus in a very, very short period of time with no advance notice. So the first one is, as I come down out of the power loop, I'm a little bit offline and I'm about to fly into this tree. And right about here is the first time that I start to notice that I am not lined up correctly on my gap. And you'll see me begin to correct to the right with right roll. Here comes the right roll. And immediately I see trees in front of me and know I am not lined up on my gap. Again, now you're going to see me correct to the left very hard, and I overcorrect. And that is, that's just because this is all happening so quickly that I'm not as precise as I might like to be. 
And here's the third visual stimulus, which is the realization that I've overcorrected. I'm now looking at the ground, and I'm going to go back to the right and fix that. And I just barely get out of here by the skin of my teeth. Now, this is not an example of the best flying I've ever done. Those, corre those corrections were wild stabs at the sticks with mad overcorrections. Many other pilots would have done that much better and more professionally, but that's just where I'm at. The only thing I really want you to take from this is this really demonstrates the ability to respond to visual stimulus with the Runcam Eagle. My response time, the total latency of the system was enough that even in a rapidly changing scenario like this, I was able to respond fast enough to fly out of it. And this example to me, more than anything else, says that at least for me as a pilot, the Runcam Eagle is, is the latency is acceptable. Because gosh, I never want to find myself in situations where I'm having to respond that quickly to branches and trees in the ground coming at me. And if you find yourself in situations where you're needing to respond faster than that, maybe the latency of the eagle matters to you, but probably it doesn't. It's a matter of feel. Some people will fly it, and just like perhaps going from SBUS to CPPM, they'll say, I just don't like the feel. It feels a little more disconnected. But I would like to point out that the difference from SBUS to CPPM is something like three or four times more latency than we're talking about here. It's really not that much latency we're talking about here. All in all, between the statistical results and the practical results, I don't feel like the latency of the Runcam Eagle is an issue for me, and maybe for you too. That's all for now. Happy flying.